My name is Sarah Golden. I've taught math here for five years, and I'm going to address today this question, which I'm sure you've all thought in a math class. You've probably said it out loud in a math class before. And you should be thinking this. You should want to know, are we really going to use this, and, and how? How am I really going to use this? So as a math teacher, and probably if you're a teacher, you can, you can relate, when I hear this question, I kind of shudder. I go, oh my gosh, I don't know. Well, we have some stock answers that you've probably heard. We say, this is my favorite, this is the one I use the most. Well, it's really more about the problem solving method. Or the vague one. Well, we're trying to prepare you for a lot of different careers. So, and then you kind of trail off and keep teaching. Or <laughs> when all else fails. <laughs> you need to graduate, don't you? All of these have a grain of truth to them. They all have a grain of truth, but they're all a little bit unsatisfying. And the problem is that the question is actually a lot more complicated than when are we just, when are we going to use this? When will I be solving this equation? <coughs> so I want to start off talking about how you're not going to use math in the real world. Definitely not like this. This is a problem from our actual Algebra 2 textbook. Cedar chest has a length that is three feet longer than its width and a height that is one foot longer than its width. The bond is 30 cubic feet. What's the width? So, okay, students, help me out. When you see this question, what, what pops into your head? Volume. Oh, you guys are good. We're all talking about volume and the, and the measurements. Why wouldn't you just measure it in the real world? Yeah. <laughs> in what situation? Would you know that the length is three feet longer than the width, and you would know the total volume, but you wouldn't just grab a tape measure and measure the width? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe you know you need to hold 30 cubic feet, and you've got these dimensions, and you're just trying to find them. I can sort of see how you might need to find the third one, but that's not great. You should just have a measure, some way to measure this. I like this one. This is not our book, but this one even said, oh, I'm going to use this. Well, if you're studying elephants and grizzly bears, <laughs> uh, and you know that an elephant runs at a speed of 25 miles per hour, and for some reason you're comparing that to the speed of a grizzly bear that you don't know, and yet you know that they're exactly related by 5 sixths, the fraction. Well then, yes, of course you would write a linear equation using a fraction. Of course, biologists do this all the time. Don't you guys know that? And this is the absolute worst one that I've seen. Hot air balloon flies at a speed of n plus 8 miles per hour. At this rate, how long would it take to fly n squared plus 5n minus 24 miles? <laughs> well, you guys know that hot air balloonists measure speed and distance with polynomials, right? <laughs> plus, you're really interested in becoming a hot air balloonist, I'm sure. <laughs> so the problem with these is that you all see right through it. And, and we know that this is not how math is used in the real world. These are examples of what Dan Meyer calls pseudo-context. Dan Meyer is an education blogger. He's been a math teacher for a really long time. He has a lot of really interesting ideas about the state of math education right now. He also has a really interesting talk on TED, so if you're ever on TED, he's got a great one there. And he says that pseudo-context sends two signals to our students, both of which are false. Math is only interesting in its applications to the real world, and, by the way, we don't actually have any of those. <laughs> so the first point would be a whole other topic, that you can derive value, you can enjoy math just in its abstract patterns and relationships. That's something separate. What I want to talk about is the second problem, is that we don't always do a good job of explaining how math is used in the real world. We sometimes fail you when we fall back on those stock responses <laughs> and just say, let's just learn it, let's just get through it, and let's move on. We don't always get this right. So, if this is not how you use math in the real world, then how do you use math in the real world? And I have one story to try and tell you how I realized we use one little part of math in the real world. This is my better half, Matt. Uh, you might know that he flies planes. He's a pilot for Continental Express, which is now United Express. <laughs> he likes to talk about flying, but like, a lot. So over the last 10 years, I have picked up some basics about the principles of flight. 
few weeks ago, Matt was relating a discussion that he'd had with his co-pilot about what to do when a plane is stalling at a high altitude. And so we have to do a little bit of a side. When a plane stalls, it's not like your car stalling, the engines don't cut out. A plane stalling is when the wings aren't producing enough lift. So this is kind of a diagram about a wing. This is a cross section of an airplane wing. And just real quickly, your physics teachers can tell you a whole lot more about aerodynamics than I can. But essentially, the shape of the wing and how it's moving through the air creates different pressures. And so there's lower pressure above the wing, higher pressure below the wing. So that ends up with a net force up that's pushing the wings up, which lets your plane fly. There's a lot of other complicated things, but that's the basics that I'm going to stick with right now. And if your eyes are kind of glassing over right now, that's OK. That's what mine do when Matt's talking about flying sometimes. <laughs> But all of a sudden, he said, it all goes back to the lift equation. And I went, we're talking about equations now? Matt is not a mathy person. I mean, I could talk about equations at home all the time. But Matt, when he took his fall semester calculus final in high school, after 10 minutes, he turned in a blank final and went to breakfast. <laughs> that is Matt's history with mathematics. He's not into equations. So the fact that he's not talking about equations made me interested. Well, this is the equation that he was talking about. I went and looked, up, looked it up later. So lift is equal to 1 half, this is rho, the density of the air. V squared, V is the velocity, the, pl the plane's airspeed. And then A and C is when I'm going to kind of gloss over it. It's sort of the area and the shape of the wing. And this is the coefficient of lift. It has to do with the angle of attack. So is the plane pointed up or down as you're flying? I recognize this equation from Algebra 2 as an example of joint variation. In an Algebra 2 classroom, I would say the lift varies jointly or varies directly or varies proportionally as the density of the air, the square of the velocity. 